Hi, thank you for joining us today. This is the first edition of GoEasyCats.com, Arizona football preview show. Troy Hutchison joined alongside Matt Moreno and our co-host, uh, Joe Tafoya, Arizona football legend, uh, part of the 1998 12-1 and uh, Holiday Bowl team. Uh, thank you for joining us, Joe. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. Go Wildcats. I can't wait to see the season. <laughs> Yes, let's talk about this offseason for Arizona. Uh, this offseason was kind of a crazy one for the Wildcats. Uh, a lot of coaching changes, Kevin Sumlin out, Jed Fish in, new defensive staff, new offensive staff. Uh, just initial takeaways from the craziness of the offseason. Well, there were some moments of um, great sorrow. There were some brilliant moments. And now we have to do a lot of waiting. So we're going to sit around, wait, and see. And one of the moments of great sorrow came when we figured out that um, none of our actual alumni was going to be uh, coaching, head coaching at the University of Arizona. And we had several meetings ahead of time to try and, you know, get a feel, get our heads around what was happening at the U and uh, had several discussions with the staff over there and, um, when the decision was made, it was sort of made independently away from us. And I, I think all of us were feeling a little bit let down at the moment. And then we got to know Coach Fish and we've seen him work. And throughout the off season, uh, he's got many of us to buy in. And now there's a level of excitement. And so that's where the joy comes from. We're excited again and everyone's feeling excited about the upcoming season and now we're in the waiting game and we even have to wait a little bit longer because the game doesn't start until what nine o'clock well so 7 30 7 30 kickoff time feels like nine <laughs> <laughs> but i mean you know you talk about the new energy around the program and getting to know coach fish and his staff um one thing that i noticed right away was jed was all, all on board and talking to the alumni, getting together in meetings. What was that process like? How, how did that come about? Yeah, from the moment he took the reins, um, he was very interested to know our opinions and how he could um, circle the wagons and bring everybody back into the fold. He did a really nice job of communicating what his mission was. And, you know, overall, he, he brought a little bit of life back into what I thought was kind of a lifeless program with under the Kevin Sumlin era. And it's, it's, you know, been one of those things where as you watch him work, the more appreciation you have for the guy, because it's nonstop. And I'm not just talking like what he's doing in front of the media behind the scenes. He's calling us. You know, he's bringing guys like Gronkowski back in. He's bringing uh, Teddy Bruschi into the fold, Brandon Sanders. And then obviously with the coaches, he's bringing, you know, the right people on board. And so it's more than just talk. He, he's actually doing some stuff. And um, there was a lot going on in the offseason. And I feel like now that we're sort of through the hard part, we've gotten to the point where all of us are bought in. We're excited and we can't wait to see the product that happens out on the field. I know Teddy Bruschi uh, back in the spring game, he mentioned he kind of realized that that Jed Fish got it early on that he, you know, he got it. He got, he understood kind of where, what was important to you guys. But one of the things he pointed to was uh, him wearing coach Tommy's jacket and kind of remembering coach Tommy in that way, by you know, wearing that windbreaker at the spring game. Was there something throughout your talks or your interactions with him that you said, this, this guy gets it. He understands what's important to us as alumni and uh, just kind of gets it as a head coach here. You know, he's, he's got a wealth of experience in the NFL and the NFL is very different than college football. And I, my initial thought was, you know, he's going to come in and he's going to have lots of schemes and, you know, bring the NFL mentality. And it wasn't like that at all. And the moment that I knew that this was going to be different and he was going to have, he, he got it, like you said, was in our initial conversation with him. He called a Zoom meeting. It was all very personal. That's not just a mantra that they have this year. It was very personal for him. He brought his family into the mix. And, you know, with 
Coach Tomey, under Coach Tomey, everyone was family. He knew everyone's name for every recruiting visit that every recruit that came in, he knew their name, he knew their their where they came from, their family's name. And Jed Fish is, you know, doing a lot of similar things. Him wearing Coach Tomey's jacket is a nod to the past. And him bringing us back into the fold is also a nod to the past. And you need that. When you have a program that's had 12 losses in a row and you're down, you need the people that are the closest to you to believe in you first. And I think he's done a really nice job of that, of bringing, you know, not just us, the alumni, but the fans, the diehard fans, you know, we're all starting to believe he's, he's opened up the doors back to the media. And so the media is getting access to things again. So I, I can't say enough good and positive things at the moment. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk about uh, Arizona, going back to Dick Tomey, uh, Desert Storm defense, it seems like they're trying to go back to the basics. You bring in Coach Brown, who's known as a aggressive play caller on the defensive side of attacking the quarterback. Uh, you're switching. And I know this, it's the little things that matter, but you're switching from thousands of uniform combinations, which fans don't seem to care about here at Arizona, back to the basics uh, the Desert Swarm uniforms with a little bit of a new flair. How much does that mean to not only you, but the alumni? I mean, I for me, I think it's really cool. And, I, you know, I don't know how much it means to anyone else that, you know, this era that we're talking about is the era that I played in. <laughs> so obviously, you know, it it's something that when I look at it, I say, oh, wow, I, this is something that... I can understand it's important. It's not just important to me. It's important to him. It's important to the fans and, and going back to the basics is how you win. You, you go back to the fundamental things when you lose and you, you have too many schemes going and you're, you're getting your butt kicked on the field. If you go back to the fundamentals, you go back to the things that made you successful on your rise to success, the things that got you there. Um, that's ultimately how you change the momentum and get things to go your way. What do you guys think about the uniforms? I know that's my era, so of course I love them. <laughs> it looks like, you know, a uniform that would be long in the SEC or any of those other, you know, big conferences. It just looks classic to me and uh, definitely got away from that for a little bit. I felt the the fan frustration from the gradients and all these different things that they were trying to do. But to me, it just looks classic. And to me, that that screams college football and I think when you look at Jed Fish and what he's trying to do, he's trying to kind of hark back to, uh, you know, tradition and build, you know, connection to the past. And to me, that's the easiest way to do it. And it was one of those decisions where it said, why didn't somebody just think of this before? It, it just felt like, hey, just go back to those uniforms. They look great. I don't know if there's anybody who says anything bad about them. And uh, it just fits. And to me, it's just a classic look that I really like. You can kind of overthink it, I think, with here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, with the Seahawks, they do lots of uniform variations. Um, the Oregon, Oregon Ducks, they feel like it really helps them with recruiting. It's different, though. I mean, those teams are known for that type of thing. And Arizona, we didn't really have something we were really known for, except for hard-nosed football. And I think going back to that, and like you said, just having that real classic look, I think that's going to speak volumes. Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at the most successful college football programs around the country, the USC's, Notre Dame's, Ohio State's, Michigan's, or in Jed uh, Fish's case, when he was at Florida, um, they don't change their uniforms. You know, they have the home uniform, the away uniform. Every now and then they'll show a fancy new uniform on a Friday or Thursday night game. But it's always the classic look. You know that's Florida going out there when you see the Gator running across the helmet. When you see the Trojan, you know that's the Trojans. Um, and I feel like Arizona not only will play on the field, but you, you, uh, their uniforms, they lost an identity. And it's kind of getting back to your identity. Um, it's a program that if you talk to a lot of people, not only in the sports uh, journalism world, but fans, for the past three years, nobody knew what, the identity of U of A football is now, now you're getting back to it. Yeah. You know, where it really works is when you have a huge fan base NFL style and all of those color changes, 
you have new fans that are bandwagon fans and they want the latest and greatest gear. They want the newest stuff. That's when it works. <laughs> Merchandising, making money off of that type of thing. Um, no, I'm not sure we're quite there yet. Uh, and I'm surprised you didn't name Alabama as one of the classic uniforms too. <laughs> and, you know, BYU is known as a program of stability, rotating guys in and out, a lot of experience. Uh, you have older players there too. But uh, they do welcome a new offensive line coach and Daryl uh, Funk. Daryl Funk. I almost messed up that name there. But um, he's coming around uh, to BYU and has a lot of coaching experience. Coached at Michigan, not during the same time as Don Brown. But, um, you know, you were talking about the off bluff tackle that just left BYU. You have three returning starters. But you add in the factor of a new offensive line coach. And how much, how much is that an adjustment for the team? Well, we're going to find out on both sides, right? Because we've got the same thing going on at U of A. Um, in college, is a little different. You know, you've got an 80-man roster and um, versus the 53-man roster. So you have some depth. And you have some things that you can play around with. And you have you can focus on um, what you what your team is really good at. And if they're good at running the ball, they're going to run the ball. And they'll find the right guys in the roster or on – it's not the waiver wire, I forget what it's called, <laughs> where they can bring um, uh, other players in. They can, they can formulate their team around the style that, that best suits them. I think they're going to do a good job of that. The, their coaching staff is top-notch. And we shouldn't expect this to be any less than a dominant team you know, when I think of the dominant conferences, I, I had to really stop and think, is BYU in a dominant conference? And then I realized they're not even in a conference. They're like individual, right? Yeah, they're independent. 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 That's what it is. Yeah. So um, that's why I'm, I, I know that they have been dominant for a long time and they've had a great coaching staff. And I think they just offered their coach an, an extension through 2025. So that says a lot about him, too. But when you have a, a dominant team for that long, you know, they, it's hard for a team like that to fall too far backwards is what I'm trying to say. They're going to be good. They kind of have that feel of, I think, what every program really wants and what they strive for is, again, just consistency. And you know what you're going to get. You can Again, it just changes. You change the faces, but you know what they're going to look like up front. You know what they're going to look like for the most part defensively, uh, even offensively. You kind of have a good feel for what they're going to be. And so, uh, you know, every coaching staff is out to do that. And uh, Kalani Sataki has continued to do that and, and has just kept it moving. And uh, it's one of those things where you're just not going to be surprised by what you see. You know what BYU football stands for. And uh, I think that's a good thing for Arizona, but uh, it's, it's what every program I think strives to be is, you know, you know what to expect, you know, they're going to have veteran older players and you know what that means, you know, it's going to be a physical game and uh, you're going to have to bring the intensity and um, that's what they have on their side is they're just, uh, it's, it's a program of consistency for sure. I'm glad you took his name and said it correctly. <laughs> I was going to butcher that. There's a lot of syllables on that roster. Over there. <laughs> we don't have to announce the game. That's a good part of that. <laughs> Um, but, you know, Arizona BYU, this game in Vegas is going to be their 25th meeting all time. First meeting came in 1936 with an Arizona win 32 to six uh, high high powered offense back for that era of football. Arizona leads the series 12, 11 and one. It's been a very close series uh, with about three points separating the two 20 to 17. And Arizona's lost last two games on the last possession of the game, the field goal up in Glendale, and then the Kevin Sumlin opening his era game where it felt like a blowout, but Arizona somehow only lost by five, and it just felt like a real downer that game. But, you know, we talked about it. When you think of BYU, it's running the football, it's physical football, it's great defense, and usually it's, it's a very close game between the two. And another exciting aspect of this game is where they're playing it. They're playing it in Las Vegas, in the new mm -hmm. stadium. And um, I read a tweet from Jed Fish and from, I can't remember who it was. I think it was the director of Pac-12 saying that there are going to be over 55,000 fans in attendance. That is a professional style game. 
Yeah. And you have to imagine a lot of them are going to be BYU fans because of, you know, just the closeness and they travel. But uh, I think when talking to the players this week, that was, I think, what excited them most was the opportunity to, and even the coaches, Brandon Carroll, the offensive coordinator, even mentioned it. Like, this is a big time atmosphere and we have to get the players ready to, to experience that. But I think if you're a player to open your season, not only in an NFL venue and a place you, every player on this team hopes they can be eventually, but uh, to have that type of crowd is, is exactly what you want. It's going to feel like a big football environment. And I know Jed Fish was saying earlier in the week that he hoped it would be a split uh, a split crowd. And he believes that would be, you know, just enjoyable for everybody involved. But um, yeah, I mean, if that's exactly what you want to you know, take part in. I think if you're a team and you're a player and um, I mean, I think it's going to be a great atmosphere. Obviously it's a holiday weekend in Las Vegas. I, you know, everyone's going to be a little bit rowdy and, and uh, it'll be an opportunity for everyone to have fun and, you know, kick off the football season, especially, you know, coming off this year where this last year, where couldn't have fans in the stands. I think everyone's just eager to kind of get back to, a little bit of normalcy and just having fun again at these football games. Matt, when you say rowdy, do you mean drunk? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Maybe just a little BYU fans don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> rowdy. When in Vegas. <laughs> there you go. So, Joe, let me ask you, you know, you played at Arizona. You've been in a lot of college football environments. Have you ever, ever had a chance to play in an NFL stadium when you're in college? And if not, what's the closest environment to that that Arizona is going to experience? that you played in? You know, that was such a long time ago. I don't remember if I ever played in a professional football stadium while in college. However, I played at the Horseshoe at Ohio State in front of 110,000 fans. And even though there were a lot of people there and it was kind of an overwhelming scene, you don't really, they're not really that close to you. So you don't feel the fans the way that you do at a place like Autzen Stadium or um, over at the UW at Washington where the fans are sitting like directly on top of you and when they're screaming you can hear every one of them and what they're saying to you um, that's the type of environment that you want you want the excitement you want the adrenaline you you want to um, have that energy coming in from the fans and you want to feed into that you know the the fans they can play a large role in the game. They can swing momentum from one direction to the other, you know, and a, a big play that happens in front of um, 55,000 fans, you're going to feel it and you're going to be excited about it. And if you have a bad play, you're also going to feel that one too. So this is definitely the type of environment that every guy wants to be in who's playing at this level. Um, in my experience, and I've got a lot of it playing in front of huge, crazy fans, fan bases. Um, you have to start fast. If you start slow and you let that crowd sit on top of you and you, you get behind early, it's really hard to come back with. It feels like such a monstrous task. In Super Bowl 40, I was in Detroit and we played against the Steelers. Who, so it was basically a home game for them. And you look into the stands and we saw all of their terrible towels waving. It felt like an away game. We hung in that game until the very end. And if we didn't, it would have been a totally different story. We would have been blown out, even on the biggest stage. So the thing I'll say to the young guys that are playing in this game right now is everyone's going to be watching you. <laughs> everyone is going to be watching you. Your high school girlfriend, your your friends, moms, your parents, all your family that's proud of you, your elementary school teacher, everyone's watching. So this is the time to shine right now. Start no from. pressure. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, not a, what do you remember from uh, playing in college football that first game? That first, like the opening game your freshman year? Or freshman. Just the environment. Yeah. I'll tell you a game that I remember vividly was – the game in Happy Valley against Penn State when Arizona was ranked number four going into that game. I remember during practice being very distracted, going on the airplane, being very distracted, getting to the stadium, opening the door to a sweltering heat and an enormous fan base and also being very distracted and getting our butts kicked. That's what I remember. You walk into a hostile environment like that, unprepared, 
you're going to get your butt kicked. Now we were playing one of the best teams that Penn state has ever had. And I will say that, you know, everything that we did leading up to that season was all based on hype from the season before today's wildcats. They don't have to worry about that. (laughs) If anything, if they have even a little bit of success, we're going to call that a win or people will call that a win. I won't call it a win. So, so the pressure is really on BYU because BYU has had a lot of success. They're coming off of an 11 one season and it's, there's a lot of pressure on them. So I would say the thing that I remember the most is when you walk into a hostile environment, you have to be prepared and you have to start fast. Arizona, we already kind of talked about it. What we know about Arizona is the new coaching staff. But I want to focus real quick specifically on Ricky Hundley and Chuck Cecil having alma maters there. How important was that for you guys to have somebody that represents not only the past of Arizona, but help to rebuild the future? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that we were all very excited to see them go on the staff we were very excited to have them be sort of the conduit and, you know, that, that foot in the past, the hard nosed football, bringing something to this program that it's been missing for a long time, which is the tough identity, you know, give me five guys that are ready to fight over five prima donnas any day, you know, that type of mentality. You think of somebody who's hard nosed football player, Chuck Cecil comes to, the top of every list, <laughs> Ricky Henley is not too far behind him. And when I watch them coach, their style of coaching is in your face. It's aggressive. It's no backing down. Doesn't matter how tall you are. Doesn't matter how fast you are. You want to knock somebody's teeth in. Let's go do it. Let's go do it together. And when you see that and you see it, that product start to show up on the field, you're going to have a different appreciation for what it was like to play back when they played rules have changed. (laughs) You can't do some of the same stuff. Now we have face masks, (laughs) but I, I think, you know, that's just such a wonderful nod to the past. And I think it's, you know, for us, for the alumni and for the people who really care deeply about this program, I don't think you could have two better guys on that staff than Ricky Hunley and Chuck Cecil. What, what were your guys' thoughts when they announced I know I talked to you, Troy, about it, but you know, behind the scenes, what are you guys saying? Because Ricky doesn't have a ton of experience. Yeah, I think it was one of those things where it felt like it was, again, a, trying to bridge to the past. And But I think both you look at both of those careers and they're qualified. I mean, they both had time in the NFL. Chuck Cecil was a defensive coordinator in the NFL for quite a while and obviously had his kind of reputation for being that aggressive, hard-hitting you know, player in the NFL. And so... I think for one thing that I've noticed, just having a chance to really see them dig into coaching and really being close to what they're doing as coaches, uh, to me, they just command respect. And I think that goes kind of across the board uh, for a lot of the coaches on staff. You have a lot of former head coaches. You had a lot of coaches that have been in the NFL, been at high level schools. And I think to me, the the shift that I think I saw with the players is uh, just respect and a true admiration for what those guys have done. Obviously, those their banners, Chuck Cecil and Ricky Hunley, they have banners in the indoor facility. So the players can look up and see, hey, those guys are they did some things during their time, you know, in college and, and in their playing careers. And so um, I, I think across the board, uh, what Jed Fish has done with his staff has really brought in guys that command respect. And, and that's a huge deal when you're talking about college age, college age athletes. And um, if you can kind of reach them and say hey, and get them to buy into what you're doing, I think it's a big deal. And so. Um, watching Ricky Hunley, especially uh, watching him coach, it's he doesn't pull any punches. I think he really he tells you what what he what he, you need to hear and not necessarily what you want to hear. And I think that's good for a lot of the players. And I think they they respect it. I think for a lot of these college players and even when talking to them when they're recruits, what they want is someone to just be truthful with them and say, hey, what do I need to get better at? You know where I want to get to. You've been where I want to get to. And um, I think that's commanding a lot of respect, not only from guys that are going to be coming in next year with the recruiting class, but on the team right now, I think. Both of those guys, because of what they've done at Arizona, what they've done in their careers, both playing and coaching at different levels, really commands respect. And that, to me, is the thing that's really stood out about both of them and the the staff at large. 
Yeah, I think it's not only, you know, getting to that next level like they both have been. Uh, Ricky Hundley, obviously, a long NFL career. Chuck Cecil, same with him. But it's being able to look at your guys and be and say, you know what, I, I've been in your shoes, not only as a player, but in this on this field, you know, in this environment. And I got from where you are to the NFL where you want to get. And just knowing how to translate that, how to coach. When you talk to uh, Coach Hundley, it only takes, I think, about like two minutes to really realize that, man, this guy can coach. Like, how I'd run through a wall for him. I mean, he's just a very charismatic guy, and he tells you like it is. Um, I'll never forget a question that one reporter for, I think, the uh, Zona Zoo, you know, one of the student reporters asked Coach Hunley, why should students uh, buy passes to go to football games? And he just had this, like, dumbfounded look on his face. He goes, why the hell wouldn't you? You're a college student. Where else are you going to be? And it's that uh, candid honesty that I think really gets at today's generation. It's not beating around the bush. It's just straight, straight at you, telling it like it is. I guess I'm one generation removed because in my experience in dealing with uh, the young student athletes today, they, they want to hear good things about themselves. <laughs> they, you know, the, the guys that are the top recruits, if you say something bad about them, they'll go somewhere else. So I don't know that much about recruiting and it, that's probably a good thing because <laughs> it was such an interesting time in life. But I, I really hope that tough nose in your face style of coaching brings the right kind of players, you know, because nowadays with the way uh, it's such a business and, and every, all the colleges are spending big money on recruits and recruiting, you kind of have to bend over a little bit. You have to bend over backwards to get these guys to come to your school. Are those the guys we want? I'm not sure. So I, I really hope that this style brings the right type of players. One thing we do know about Arizona is Jet Fish announced they will be running a two quarterback system with Gunnar Cruz, the freshman transfer from Washington State, and Will Plummer, who had a few games started last year. He has some experience uh, with Arizona, not in this system as it's a whole new system. But Joe, I want to ask you because you played on that 98 team. You guys ran a two quarterback system. It was a very successful system, 12 and run uh, season. What does it take for not only the two quarterbacks to play off of each other, but the team to have confidence that both in both of them at once? It takes winning. Bottom line, you have to start winning. When you're losing and you're um, falling backwards, one guy is going to play, and then if he's not doing well, they're going to throw the other guy in. And if he starts doing poorly, you can't bring the other guy back in. So it's very complicated. I think from what I heard, Gunnar Cruz is going to start. I think he's probably a little bit further ahead of Will right now. And that could change. But I think they just need a little bit more time. I think that's what I'm hearing the coach say is that they just need a little bit more time for one or the other to separate. And then you can make your decision. If he thinks that neither one of them have stepped their game up to the level of being called the starting quarterback, then we have to trust in that. And, you know, I know if John, John Madden used to say that if you have two quarterbacks, then you don't have any, well, let's believe in, in what Jed fish is doing and let's believe in, you know, his methodology. It's the first game of the season coming off of a wild off season. They still need a little bit more time. And that's just the bottom line. One guy will stand out and it will become very obvious in the near future who that guy is. What are your thoughts, uh, Matt? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just, it's, I agree. I think it's just about time. I think if maybe they had another couple of weeks, maybe they could decide it. But I also think, as I said, right after he announced it, it to me, it feels like he just wants to see what they can do in a game. Uh, he hasn't seen them before. Gunnar Cruz had a very, very small sample size. Will Plummer had a little bit of a bigger sample size last season, but he was also thrown into the fire. I mean, he went into that UCLA game thinking, I'm not going to play today at all unless it's a blowout. And then, you know, one play in and he's on the field and, hey, you're running and you you have to go in and run this offense. And um, so you don't you didn't get the full scope of what he could do either because, you know, he just had to pick it up and run. And so um, I think for Jed Fish and, and you can watch all the tape you want from what they did uh, last year and, and previously, but he doesn't know what they're going to look like in a game. And to me, I think 
He just needs a little bit more information. He seems very much like an information type of guy. And I want to have everything in front of me. And, and yes, I have the stats and, and yes, I have all this, but he also uses that feel and his experience, like Joe mentioned that he's, he can lean on and say, I've been through this before. I've been through a situation like this before. I know how this plays out. I know what to look for. And so I think he wants to see what he can in a game. And uh, obviously you're playing BYU. It's not like you're playing, um, you know, an easy opponent that you're going to roll over that anybody would have success against. You're playing a pretty difficult team. And so I think he'll get a pretty good idea of what each guy can do. And sure, there'll be some nerves early on, but I think if they both get ample opportunities against BYU, I think you'll see a clear, you know, clear direction in this competition. Right now, it feels like Gunnar Cruz is, it's maybe his job to lose. He's going to get the first snaps, but um I think it's more about just seeing what they can do against different competition. As we mentioned, as they mentioned throughout camp, Don Brown's defense is not everybody else's defense. So Don Brown's defense is his defense. And so um, for this offense to see that every day, they're used to seeing the same thing, but it's not, it's unlike anything else they're going to see this season. So I think to see what they can do against a team like BYU and, and get a glimpse of what those guys are capable of in a game is going to give him a lot of good information and he can move forward from there. But um, I, I think it's a lot about what can these guys do when the lights are on and you never know, maybe they could be different than what they were in practice. And so I think that's kind of that separation he's looking for is, you know, maybe who's a gamer and who can really, you know, shine when the lights are on and the pressure is on more than just practice time. And so I think we'll learn a lot about the quarterback competition this week. I really don't think it maybe even lasts beyond this weekend. I think we'll have a clear answer, but um, I think it's about seeing what they can do in a game and seeing what they do can do when the pressure is early on. Yeah, I agree. And one final thought on this um, before we switch topics is that this is actually a good problem to have. You know, if you look back at, I mean, if I look back at some of the teams that I've been on where your starting quarterback gets injured and you just don't have a backup, you're in big trouble. So if you have two guys going into it that are capable of leading the team, anything can happen. It's you're one play away from having one quarterback. So it's better to have two early on. I'm going to add something else now. The, the interesting thing about this whole scenario is that they're roommates and they're really good friends. So it's not like they're not pulling for one another. It's a very odd kind of uh, battle because they are so close and, and you know, they, they live together, they're roommates. Um, and they're so close to, to see that battle kind of play out where, you know, there's not a true kind of bitterness about them going head to head. I think that adds a different element where I think the fear for every fan and everybody on the outside is, once you name a starter, the other guy's going to leave. I don't know that that's necessarily the case in this situation. I think obviously Will Plummer knows that, hey, I can go in at any moment. So you can go into a game saying, I, I'm not going to play. And next thing you know, you are. And so uh, I, I think it's one of those situations where it does benefit Arizona to have somebody, if it isn't, if it ends up being Gunner Cruz, like Will Plummer, who has some experience and you know can step in there if need be. And so I do think there's value to it. And it, it's just a matter of seeing how it plays out. I'm also interested to see how the play calling is going to go because Jed was talking about that he may script the few, uh, first few drives, you know, get a feel for the game. Uh, how are you going to break in the quarterbacks? I mean, both are fairly young. How are you going to get them used to the game? Do you do the old traditional, we're going to run the ball? Or do you do quick passes trying to get them in a rhythm early? There's a lot of things you can do there. Um, and against a defense like BYU, it, it might be good to be aggressive with such a young secondary that they have this season. Um, knowing Brennan Carroll, he came from Seattle. Um, he, he's he's going to run the ball. And you got a guy like Michael Wiley back there. You're, we're going to run the ball. And until it stops working, you run the ball. You always run the ball until it stops working. And that buys you a lot of time, especially when you have a young quarterback or somebody that you're just trying out. If you're having success running the ball, it opens the rest of the game up. Everybody knows that. Um, Troy, you mentioned back in 1998 with uh, Keith Smith and Ortiz Jenkins. Keith was the starter going into most games. They were roommates. They were friends. And it all ended up working out because we were winning. So if you start winning, then break out the playbook, start throwing in schemes, put both of them on the field at the same time. You know, get get do the formations that you make up in your dreams and go for it. But it all starts with winning. You got to start having success. One thing with Arizona this season is to rebuild this program to try to help 
ease the rebuild process and plug some holes offensively and defensively. They had 11 transfers this offseason by my total. Uh, There's a couple that left the program, but 11 transfers total and a ton on defense. Uh, Matt, looking at that linebacker position, that's where a lot of the bulk of the transfers are. Yeah, well, it, you looked at that group in the spring and you said there's two scholarship players, you know, in practice in the spring. It just, it looked dismal. It looked really bad to see, you know, there's just not the numbers there that you want at that position. And you kind of had a feeling, you knew they were going to add at least a couple guys because a couple of them were already had made their decisions that they were going to be coming to Arizona, but uh, they added even more after that. And so um, you look at that group now and you say that's both a veteran group and a deep group. It, there's a ton of depth there and they can go with, you know, any any number of combinations. And um, you look even Rashi Hodge, who came over from New Mexico State, you look at it from the outside and you go, oh, I don't know what he's really going to add to this group. And then now he could be a key player because of his versatility and what he can do. And um, Don Brown's kind of mad scientist a- approach to everything and his Dr. Blitz mentality. He can use someone like that all over the field. And um, to make plays and it's, it's just a valuable weapon to have. So um, you really look at this linebacker group and, and watching practice and say, there's a lot of, a lot of depth there and that's not what they had in the spring. And so I think those guys are going to see a lot of action. I think you're going to see a steady rotation of those guys coming in and out of the game and it'll keep them fresh and it'll give Don Brown an opportunity to, to do some different things and, um, you know, keep surprising the offense like he wants to do. But uh, it was pretty remarkable to see, the type of the, the stark difference between what it looked like in the spring when you had, you know, Anthony Pandy and Isaiah Johnson really as the only two linebackers out there that had really have any kind of experience. And now you have some guys that have been through the battles and yeah, maybe some of them have done that in smaller conferences, but a lot of those guys have produced at a very, very high level. The transfer portal is such an anomaly for me. I don't understand it. And <laughs> I played in an era where it just wasn't even an option if you were transferring out of your school there were there was a hardcore reason behind it but it felt like early on a lot of guys jumped in that portal without really thinking about what could actually happen with this program and i think some of them had some regrets going into it or coming out of it i should say but the defensive line actually did pretty well through the transfer portal as well and um Another guy that came over from New Mexico State was Roy Lopez, and he saw time in 40 games. And so he's re- he's recorded about 130 plus tackles, 20 for loss, eight sacks. That's a solid player to pick up on the defensive line. And if you want to talk about experience, let's talk about a guy that has seven. He's going into his seventh college season. Let that sink in. Seven seasons. This guy spent four spent time at four different schools. He sat out with an injury, and then the 2020 Mulligan. Aaron Blackwell is what is he like? He's my age, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really nice to have you know guys. We used to call them war daddies, guys that have been to war and understand what is going to happen in big games, and you know they don't get shaken very easily. And you, there's one thing you can't make up for, and that's experience. So nice job on the transfer portal on the defensive line as well. And someone like Aaron Blackwell, you look at him, he's playing for the love of the game. I mean, there's no other reason for him to play. He's done all he can do in school. I don't know if they're making up classes for him or what they're doing, but uh, he's still, you know, chipping away at school. But uh, you're back and playing football because you love the game. And I think that's something, even if he doesn't, you know, isn't on every down and isn't, you know, in the game every snap. It's having someone like that that can get everybody going. And he's a def- he's definitely a passionate guy. And uh, to have just a personality like that and someone who knows, has seen so much, I think is going to be vital for this team uh, because you do have so many new pieces along the defensive line. When I got to college, I was 17 years old. And there was a guy in our team named Rusty James who was 23. He had kids. He was married. <laughs> And I'm a 17 year old boy and you look across and you can see a guy like that and how he operates and how he handles himself and conducts himself, not only in school, on the field, but also at home in life. And there's a lot to be gained from having a guy like that around. So that's a nice pickup. When you look at Arizona secondary, one of the 11 transfers that Arizona landed was Isaiah Ruffleford from Notre Dame. Uh, This guy has been spectacular in spring and fall camp. He's really shown out in front of the coaches and the media. And then you have Christian Roland Wallace. Uh, One and two, Arizona seemed to be pretty deep at that position. Yeah, I mean, well, to me, just knowing what Isaiah Rutherford was as a recruit, 
and knowing what kind of offers he had and then seeing that Arizona was able to pick him up, I kind of had to do like a double take and go like, oh, wait, they got that guy? Because it, it's he's someone that you everyone knew his name when he was coming out of high school. I mean, he was one of those players that everyone was going after. He had every offer you could have wanted and ended up going to Notre Dame. It didn't work out there, but the talent is still there. Those guys don't lose their talent. That What he was, you know, coming out of high school and a highly thought of, close to being a top 100 prospect uh, coming out of high school, that, that talent is still there. And so it's just a, ma- a matter of trying to figure out how to kind of pull that out of him. And just for him, an opportunity. You know, you go to a place like Notre Dame, there's going to be a lot of challenges. They are pulling in other recruits that are just like you and you have to beat them out. And so um, even just having an opportunity like he's going to have at Arizona is going to be a big deal and going to naturally lead to more production. But uh, both him and Christian Roland Wallace, when you saw them together in the spring, you said, oh, this is these are two of their best players. And, and um, it's going to be tough for teams to really pass against them and pick and choose because there isn't a weak spot. They both can make plays. They both have they both have a ton of talent and it's going to be difficult to try and find holes uh, in that defense when those guys are, are locking down. And so um, they both have you know similar size, size and skill sets. And uh, it's going to be a difficult task, I think, for teams to really uh, exploit them because they don't have very many holes in their game and um, just very talented, talented players who – uh, if they play their cards right, they're going to continue playing after they get out of college. And so uh, a very huge pickup. And again, I just really couldn't believe when Arizona pulled that, pulled that off. I was like, wow, that's that's a big pickup for, for a school like Arizona. Not, no doubt about that. And what you look for with a guy like that is, you know, somebody who's feeling a little bit slighted coming off of, you know, out of a big program like that, feeling slighted. They play with a chip on their shoulder. You mentioned, I mean, he, this guy had offers from all of the top schools, Alabama, Oregon. I mean, he was, he could have gone anywhere and he ended up going to school where he went to school. Didn't work out. Notre Dame. Now he's in Arizona after being in a top program. You know, he's, he's got a chip on his shoulder. He's got something to prove. And a kid like that, with that type of talent. um, And and then you have, you know, a, a guy like Chuck Cecil helping coach him up. Look for big things. You need playmakers. Sometimes when, when things are on the line, you look to your playmakers, he's a playmaker. Look to him. And, you know, he's, like we were saying, a transfer from Notre Dame. Uh, one thing that really stood out to me when I first saw him was his size and the ability to keep receivers downfield. Joe, you played with one of the best Arizona corners of all time in Chris McAllister, and I believe he was a transfer at well, as well. What do you remember about playing with Chris? I remember when we were in training camp at Camp Cochise and Chris McAllister was standing on the sideline. Everyone thought he was a linebacker or a strong safety and a huge fight breaks out in the middle of practice and Dwayne Aquina and Charlie Dickey, two coaches are fighting each other. Everybody's fighting. And Chris McAllister jumped in the mix. He's he just transferred over from UCLA and he's already fighting with his team, fighting with his brothers. Um, there weren't a lot of huge guys, huge corners playing in the Pac-10 back when I played. Chris McAllister uh, was by far and away the best one. And what I remember the most about him was his presence alone on the field, just knowing that he was back there. And he was going to either knock the ball loose, cause an interception. He, you just had this comfort while rushing the passer, knowing that you might have that split second extra of time to go after the quarterback, make your spin move back inside. Relying on a guy like that, um, it made us a better team all the way around. Without Chris McAllister, I'm not sure we'd been we would have been that 12 and one team. So BYU, they've always been known to have big, sweaty beefy offensive linemen that never wash their gloves. They'll put their hands in your face and you walk away smelling them. (laughs) These guys, the offensive line is the heartbeat of every team. And so when, if you can build your team around an offensive line, like the one that BYU has, you're going to be a pretty talented group. You know, when I played in Seattle, we had a guy named Walter Jones, hall of famer. We had another guy named um, Steve Hutchinson, hall of famer. We had a guy named Robbie Tobeck, should have been a Hall of Famer. And those three guys made up the majority of the heartbeat on our team. 
who gets all the credit? The running back, Sean Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> this is a tough group of guys. Uh, I'm not sure that we have the what it takes on the physical side to match up well with them, but we you can't count us out with the scheming and the blitz packages that Brown's going to put together. It'll this is going to be an interesting one for us guys, and if we can start fast and do well early on, I think we've got a shot at it. Matt, what have you seen out of Arizona's defensive line that might be a positive going for them? in this football game. Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to be very active. I think if you look at what they're doing, they're going to be very active and kind of a lot like the linebacker group. There's a, just a lot of depth there. There's a, there's there's going to be a lot of players that have an opportunity to play. Um, I think Addy Mo Diallo, another guy that's coming from a, a smaller conference from Central Michigan, he had played at Texas A&M for a bit, but uh, he kind of feels like an equalizer in a lot of ways for their defensive line for this game and beyond, because, you know, he's someone that they can plug in kind of anywhere along the defensive line, uh, really looks like a natural fit at defensive end and uh, has the size, has the length to be disruptive. But I really like what Jalen Harris has done this, this off season. I mean, you look at him and I've watched him kind of, I watched him in high school and you see him kind of progress every season. You go, this, this is going to be the year. And then this is going to be the year. And uh, he finally has reached that point. I think where that, potential that everyone saw in him as a young player is going to turn to production. And he's really, I think on, on track to have a really, really strong season, a really productive season. And so um, there's a lot of athleticism, I think on the edges and uh, some, some better size inside uh, Trey Mason, Trayvon Mason uh, is someone that has really been productive over the last couple of seasons is kind of coming into his own as well. Um, and then there's just a deep group. And I really like what they've done uh, just adding depth, going again to the transfer portal and finding some guys and, uh, being able to add some pieces up front that um, have been through the battles and understand what it means to, to you know, play in a game like this. And so I think for them, it's it's going to be a lot of movement. I think there's going to be a lot of guys coming in and out and keeping guys fresh. And I think that's going to be really one of the strengths for Don Brown's defense is that there, there is a lot of depth. As much as it maybe doesn't, shouldn't feel like it with a team that's lost its last 12 games, they've been able to really build some nice depth. And it's not just depth because there's numbers, there's really quality players, you know, up and down the lineup on defense. And it feels like it's kind of be, it's starting to be that shift uh, between, you know, everyone, everything being about the offense and going fast and in the quarterbacks and the receivers, it really feels like Arizona is starting to kind of turn the dial back to being kind of more defensively focused. And you look at, you know, the depth that they've added, the guys that they've really targeted on that side of the ball, obviously it needed a lot of help. There was a bunch of guys that have left over the last couple of off seasons. And so um, it feels like they really have done that and really have been smart about who they've added. And it's guys that are going to play and contribute. And to me, uh, all that depth, I think, is really going to help this season and, and help this weekend. I'm glad you mentioned Jalen Harris, because an article came out today about him earning the number one number on his jersey. Uh, I don't understand what that is, but I guess it's something that's had to be earned. Uh, I thought number 49 looked good on him, especially since it's a number that his dad wore and wore proudly and wore well. But um, what do you guys think about the the number one jersey for uh, a premier defensive lineman? Well, Arizona hasn't had a defensive lineman since uh, Holmes wore number one back when Mike Stoops was the head coach. So it's been a long time. Uh, usually I think you see interior linemen like D tackles, number nine, number one, number three is popular, but it's unique. I kind of like it. I think it's unique. Yeah. I was a little surprised that he made that decision just because of the connection that number 49 has to him and his family. But uh, I think for him, it was a matter of that it had to be earned and it was something that had to be, had to be earned that I think really is meaningful to him. Um if you look at the two guys who earned the number one jerseys, which Jed Fish made it a competition because there were a few guys who wanted to wear that number, uh, it's hard to argue with Stanley Berryhill and Jalen Harris as being the two kind of MVPs of the offseason. I mean, you look at the work they've done from, you know, when Jed Fish was first hired or when last season ended up until now, uh, they've been consistent and they've been productive. And uh, both those guys I thought were very deserving of that, that award and that honor or whatever we're going to be calling it. But um, I think both those guys are, are going to be two of the better players on this team and two of the most productive players on this team. And um, I think for Jalen Harris, like I said, I think he's just really poised. I don't know what's changed or if it's just a matter of, you know, just being around the game long enough and really kind of developing and, and covering recruiting like I do. It, it feels like fans are ready to jump ship when a player isn't, you know, a star as a freshman. And sometimes 
there is development that has to happen and there is you know work that has to be done before these guys are able to reach that potential that everyone saw in them. And, and so I think you're seeing that with a lot of guys on the team, but yeah, it is definitely odd to see a defensive end have that number and we'll see what happens. And if it, maybe he'll switch back if things don't work out and it's off to rough start, he'll switch back. But uh, yeah, I thought it was surprising to see him kind of switch out of his dad's number and, you know, go with a different route. And he even said, Jason, I think is going to keep number six. So number 49 is now out there with, without a home. And so we'll see what happens, but it was definitely a surprise to see him not win that, but, you know, decide, Hey, I want to be number one. I like the idea of it being this symbolic move, like you said, Matt, of him, like it, we're all waiting for it to happen. You're waiting for it to happen. And finally, this is the year, you know, because there were some qualifications for them to earn that number one, right? They had to make every single practice, couldn't be late, they had to have their GPA. So they, it wasn't just given to them. Um, the message was is that this is something that's earned. So maybe this is a symbolic transition for him. He's stepping out of old shoes into new one. And we really need that right now. So we could use uh, um, an edge player and somebody who defines the defense on the edge. Give him number one. It stands out a lot better than 49. 49 looks like a long snapper. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, on BYU, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, Jaron Hall is going to be the starter. Uh, BYU has their death chart already out. He's played in seven games, one touchdown pass. 420 yards, 31 and 46. Uh, so not not a lot of experience there. Um, as a defense, Joe, how how exciting is it to get somebody new back there? Somebody that hasn't seen a lot of games and and do you kind of like foam at the mouth like, hey, we're gonna go get this guy? Or you know, what, what's the approach? I did. I always love to see. We call it fresh meat. You see fresh meat back there. You can tee off. You, if you're having a decent game, you can talk a lot of trash. You can try and take guys out of their mental state in a lot of different ways. You know, you, you talk to them in the intermissions. You're talking to them underneath the pile. You can really get into a guy's head, especially if he's brand new and doesn't really understand. You know, there are certain elements of the game that go on. It's a game inside of the game. You know, the mental part of it is easily the most important part, especially for a quarterback. So if you can get him to, you know, shift a little bit your direction, or if you're picking up on one of the keys of his snap count, or if he's um, making an audible at the line of scrimmage, you start picking up on those things. You can really rattle a quarterback by calling him out for him. And if Arizona is smart, which I, I like to believe that a, a Don Brown coach team is going to be very smart that they're going to be looking to pick up on those, those key things that are happening behind the scenes. And once they do, if they can get them rattled, a young guy like that, it's see ball, get ball, go chase that guy down. Hopefully they don't establish the running game early on though. <laughs> so keys to the game for Arizona, I think, Run defense. Arizona was horrible in run defense last year, and I think that's an understatement. 125th in the country, giving up around 270 yards a game. Um, we mentioned that the defense line has a lot more depth, looks better. Well, it's time to go out and prove that. And then special teams mentioned a little bit with Lucas Havasek. Uh, Arizona was pretty good at special teams last year with Tyler Loop coming on strong. Uh, Lucas Havasek having a good year, but you need to continue that and to win games that are going to be closed special teams will play a huge role. And then can the offensive line get a push to create holes for the running back? I think that's going to be three of the biggest question marks for Arizona and three big things for them to win this football game. Yeah, I, I would say on the, on the special teams note, I mean, I think that's, it would be nice to see them get a return. <laughs> it's been, it feels like that's been missing for such a long time that they haven't been able to get, you know, someone to return a touchdown and, uh, whether punt or kickoff or anything like that. And that could be such a, a momentum changer in a game like this. And so um, obviously Jamari Joyner would be their guy, I think, uh, in a lot of those uh, situations, but he's not going to be out there for at least a couple of weeks, uh, according to Jed Fish. So um, it'll be up to those other guys, but that's that's one of those underrated parts of the game. And um, I, I think it could be uh, something that could help them and spark, you know, spark this team in a game like this. But uh, yeah, I definitely agree with those points, Troy. Absolutely. Um... This is a road game, so you have to pack your defense and you have to pack your running game. And so if Arizona can do those two things, 
I really am a firm believer in momentum, especially at the college level. And if this game gets out of hand early with a couple of breakaway runs, some big plays early on, um, one of the keys to the game for me is going to be um, stopping the big plays. And, you know, big players make big plays in big games. This is a big game. We need our big players to step up. There's no doubt about it that the rest of college football is watching this one, especially the South. We're watching this one. Nobody's expecting Arizona to do much in it. All, all of the experts have, um, what is it, 11 point or 11 point underdogs. That doesn't mean anything. The only thing that matters is what happens when they blow the whistle in between those two lines. So let's bring our defense. And I, I really hope that BYU packed a lunch because this is going to be a long day for them too. And for BYU's side, I mean, I think it's pretty – going back to the basics as well, you win the battle of the trenches, which they have the size up front both offensively and defensively. Usually the team that wins the battle in the trenches wins the game. Uh, force Arizona's young quarterbacks into turnovers. Will Plummer last season had a few turnover issues. Gunner Cruz, we haven't seen him in a full game situation. So try to create havoc back there and then establish the rush, uh, establish the run. Like we said, Arizona, uh, 270 yards given up on the ground last season. I know that's last season. This is a new year, but uh, make them prove that they can stop the run. And I think that's what BYU is going to try to do early is establish the run. If they can't do that, then Arizona is, could make this game uh, very interesting. We will see you guys next time. Matt and I will be in Vegas, so follow us for live updates throughout the game, and we'll have more in Vegas. Have a good one. Go Cats.